Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Dear students, hope you all are doing well. Welcome to another exciting session of the course Soft Tissue Characterization and Applications. Today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic which is close to my heart which is on soft tissue simulates. So let's get started. So soft tissue simulants also sometimes uh, known as the artificial tissues, synthetic tissues, tissue surrogates, these are some of the common uh, names or terminologies used to describe soft tissue simulants. Why do we need such kind of artificial tissues in the first place, right? So uh, one of the key need for artificial tissues uh, is for realistic testing. There is a huge demand of artificial tissues not only in the surgical training uh, market but also the ballistic testing and all sorts of like you know armor testing and things like that right so typically from a surgical training standpoint think about a doctor or a medical practitioner who wants to test certain kind of surgical operations or suturing techniques or cutting techniques which they are going to perform in a real surgery beforehand right so Typically, there are uh, some uh, pads on which they can suture. They do not have the mechanical property very similar to the actual tissue. So the idea here is if there can be a artificial tissue mimic which forms those pads, then you can as if like you're suturing skin, uh, the real skin, you, you can suture on those pads innumerable amount of times. Also, if you have a certain model of a liver or a model of a esophagus and uh, different soft tissues or organs which we have already discussed then they can perform different so sorts of surgical training and practices within that right even for diseased and uh, injury cases right so these are some of the areas uh, which require uh, a lot of artificial tissues uh, and uh, that demand is currently not met by the supply right uh, the next uh, issue why we uh, require artificial tissues is for because of cadavers and live humans, uh, the testing on them pose a lot of ethical and biosafety issues, right? So ethical and biosafety issues here mean uh, you have to take an ethics approval. You have to make sure uh, when you get a cadaver, you have to take it from a recognized hospital. There has to be certain protocols and norms which are followed certain good practices, how they have the cadaver has to be stored, how old is that, how the if you cut a piece of tissue, how it has to be put back and there are so many norms and regulations around it, right, which gets complex for a new research and sometimes it's very difficult for researchers or small industries or small companies to really get access to cadavers because they do not have connections with the big hospitals, right. So you cannot be just buying cadaver of a, of a shop, right. So cadavers are difficult to obtain also live uh, humans or animal models, uh, live humans of course you cannot test, it's, it's very tricky and uh, highly uh, ethics centric and uh, also if you're looking at animal models there are a lot of rules and regulations and laws around animal models, right. You cannot be just taking any animal and uh, run a test on that, so that's, that's not possible that they have to also go through a certain range of ethical clearances. So having said that, that is one part which is the ethics part. Second is the biosafety part. Biosafety uh, part is where we are talking about how you are going to dispose the tissue of. Is there any chances of infection which can occur due to this kind of tissue, right? If you, uh, if this has been left out, not put in a right freezer in the right temperature for a while. So these kind of issues will occur very often with the experiments and tests which are conducted so far to date, right? However, if you have an artificial tissue which can actually mimic the real tissue and if you can carry that tissue in your pocket or uh, if you can just carry it from one place to another without having to think anything, 
about the ethical uh, issues or the biosafety issues that would be highly valuable for both the surgical and ballistic testing right so that's the problem statement which we are trying to address through uh, the set of lectures about soft tissue simulants that's the background on which we are trying to build right uh, further into the need for artificial tissues um, you need an artificial tissue which at least mimics the material properties similar to the natural tissue there are a lot of artificial tissues which may mimic the way the structure of a tissue is microscopical or may mimic how the tissue uh, reacts in terms of different levels of hydration or how a particular tissue can uh, you know form a certain block of a tissue engineered material and things like that or is it similar to an implantable biomaterial so many of these things are done but one thing which is often missed out is the mechanical property you want to make sure when you are making an artificial tissue that at least for the applications like surgeries uh, surgical planning and ballistic testing that it is mechanically similar to the real tissue right uh, the second one app not absolutely necessary may be necessary for certain applications which is surface properties in certain case cases where you are looking at uh, whether you are working in a textile industry for example you want to make sure you develop textile or you use textiles uh, to build the clothing uh, which is not very aggressive to the skin it doesn't cause a lot of friction uh, with the skin right so there you need to focus on the surface properties right or you are doing some kind of analysis into things which are getting in contact with the skin or uh, even uh, implants which are getting in contact with the native tissue you do not want a lot of friction frictional interactions that can cause the uh, initiation of certain wounds or infections and uh, non biocompatibility right so sometimes you want to make sure when you build the artificial tissues based on depending on the kind of application which you are planning to use it for you want to make sure that the surface properties are as similar to the natural tissue as possible like i'm going to take an example of the human skin when we make it out of silicon or some uh, synthetic material versus when we prepare it with hydrogels it has a nice hydration property right the third component which is extremely important is the biosafety so there has been a lot of artificial tissues which are built with different forms of membranes like the aminotic membrane like the different uh, silk membrane and other membranes many of these may have a biosafety issue so you want to use materials which are biologically safe right and the last thing which is very very important specifically for india is uh, you need low cost and the right rightly priced soft tissue simulant or the artificial tissues which are uh, specific and uh, uh, you know like which can cater to the needs of uh, our country and uh, several other developing countries where uh, it's a very price sensitive market right you want to have something which is much more cheaper than a cadaver and can be easily used and uh, can be used widely across hospitals and other arenas right so having said that on the right side you can see some of the uh, snapshots of different applications of artificial tissues uh, the very top you are looking at a uh, heart model a artificial heart model the benefit of that is you can not only do surgical practices but also look at certain deformities what happens if there is a certain kind of deformity in the heart can you take the uh, mri or ct images and based on that create a model create an artificial model and look at if there is a certain tumor or some some kind of an ingrowth how can you extract that and things like that so a lot of surgical planning arterial planning uh, those kind of things can be looked upon next is development of sensors or biosensors or wearable sensors specifically so there are a lot of wearable sensors which will go on top of your skin or uh, may go inside the uh, native tissue so those kind of sensors have to be uh, as close as possible in the mechanical properties to the real tissue uh, that is where you need artificial tissues right uh, because if you have a sensor which is extremely hard you cannot place it within a piece of tissue that will cause an adverse reaction or infection ballistic testing as i've already mentioned so how do bullets penetrate the different layers of skin muscles and different organs 
and what kind of armors can prevent this different bullet interactions right so these kind of things have to be understood in depth right and many of these things are missing because there is not a human dummy model which is very similar to the human model uh, one of the homeworks which you can have is uh, go back and check out some of the literature or research uh, on ballistic testing and you will see majority of those dummies which you see are extremely non-compliant in terms of mechanical properties they do not have any similar they are metallic systems and have no connection to the actual mechanical property of the different soft tissues they may mimic this mechanical properties of the skull or the bones to a certain extent but not with the soft tissues so there is no mechanical mimics uh, of the soft tissues which are available for ballistic testing or blast kind of testing out there in the market right the next one is for cosmetic implants or cosmetic surgeries planning for that you need uh, soft tissue uh, simulants or artificial tissues for building better prosthetics and orthotics right so the entire prosthetics and orthotics market needs a lot of improvement right you cannot be just placing a metal rod to simulate the natural functioning of a foot right if you can make it nice and uh, you know cozy where you have the right material properties which are placed along with the uh, you know like foot uh, mechanism you can have that as a high comfort uh, wearable uh, prosthetic for the uh, particular people who are wearing it right so those things can be looked at next is biomechanical testing you need some soft tissue simulants to make sure there can be some levels of standardization if i test the skin simulant in india versus i test this in japan it should behave very similarly that is one of the aspects which we have seen while discussing the mechanical properties is that we taste a piece of skin from here and we are not taking the right location or not reporting the right location or the thickness of the skin and it shows a property which is completely different from somebody who has tested it in somewhere in europe right so those kind of disconnects are uh, an issue like uh, with the literature reporting we need something which is repeatable and reproducible so that's why artificial tissues and their compositions can uh, help alleviate that uh, issue right so then the next one is uh, for personal protection equipment development so a lot of pps are worn by the industry um, you know like for industrial functions as well as we have worn them during the pandemic and uh, they are worn quite often by the hospital staff uh, so many of these wearable uh, you know like pps have to be compliant and do not uh, interact with the skin in a uh, wrong way that has to be looked upon right so in order to do that you need to have a artificial tissue uh, which is specifically skin in this case to make sure these ppes are interacting properly there are no rashes or long term issues which can come up with these kind of ppes right so this is a broad uh, vision or broad view of the requirement of artificial tissues let let us get into the depth of the different artificial tissues which have been developed to date uh, we are going to cover an overview uh, it is not inclusive of all the articles or all the research ones which have been developed till to date but like this is still like the state of the art what has been published so far in literature so let's get started into the different artificial tissue development uh, before we take that step uh, let us just quickly revisit the role of 3d printing or additive manufacturing which has become a very popular technology in the uh, 21st century and uh, this is a technology which is widely used for also development of artificial tissue models right uh, specifically for organ development so uh, the development of complex molds for pouring a certain material and creating a tissue or artificial tissue mimic or an organ which we have seen for the human brain in one of the previous sessions uh, uh, needs the intervention of uh, you know like 3d printing or additive manufacturing another thing is you need additive manufacturing for fabrication of fixtures for experimental tests so like i have also shown during the brain modeling that uh, the brain not necessarily is to be placed upside down or in a normal uh, kind of sitting posture and being uh, like uh, subjected to a compressive testing that is not the usual case 
you want to probably position the brain in different uh, directions and that has caused a huge variation in the stress strain profile or the stress strain property which we have seen earlier right so this correct positioning has to be brought about through development of pictures which can be very easily developed using 3d printing right if you go for the machining route it's going to take you a long time and probably cost you quite a bit right so uh, this is just a showcase of uh, you know some of the 3d printers uh, printing assemblies which are there uh, in my lab in iit delhi so we are basically looking at the different uh, 3d printing uh, based products which we want to deliver mass produce and deliver to several different hospitals during the pandemic this is of one of the products which was developed which is of the face shield right but the idea here uh, which i want to uh, you know highlight is we are now focused towards the development of the different soft tissue mimics as you can see on the right side you are looking at some arterial networks uh, in the b, b section and we are also building some molds for generating this test specimens like uh, this this was designed in solid works and then finally the red part is the mold and you are pouring a liquid which is silicon in this case uh, which has a mechanical property uh, tuned specifically with the human skin and then you take out the specimens or the samples and you test them all uh, on a utm right so these are the two purposes of using 3d printing so let us look at the first artificial tissue and the most popular one which has been uh, under a lot of research for the past 30 to 40 years which is known as the artificial skin or sometimes known as the skin simulant right so what we did find out like uh, and this is a while back in 2015 ish right we found that no surrogate or artificial skin uh, or tissue simulant exists which can mimic the anisotropic mechanical properties of the human skin anisotropic mechanical means uh, isotropic is which has property in the same direction like every direction has the same property skin is highly anisotropic like most of the other soft tissues right so we needed to build some soft tissue simulant which can mimic the anisotropic mechanical properties of the human skin that was totally missing that's what we found out from a literature search and a detailed patent search right uh, typically what was used till 2015 or 16 uh, since we uh, developed this artificial skin model uh, were porcine skin cowhide polyurethane gels or cadavers right all these materials are widely used to simulate or uh, mimic skin and they are used for surgical training ballistic testing even to date right so one of the key issues with this material uh, can be highlighted or uh, described through this plot or the graph on the left right so let's take a look uh, the real human skin property uh, is uh, highlighted here with a almost like a orange uh, skin color which is uh, written as the human skin so that is the human skin property approximately uh, then uh, you have the porcine skin property so we are looking at the stress strain profile or a stress stretch profile stretch is nothing but strain plus one just the plot shifted uh, if you are looking at the porcine skin property it is much more stiff or stronger than the human skin so that clearly indicates if we are using a porcine or a pig skin to run some experiments or run some analysis it is going to give us very different results from what a human skin would give us that's why it's not a very good candidate the next one is gels so gels are extremely soft like pdms gels and these kind of gels these are also often used uh, and called as like an artificial skin or skin simulant in majority of the research articles and other uh, research groups which we have seen so these gels have mechanical property much lower than that of the human skin so again this indicates that they cannot be used to simulate the human skin properties all right so with that gap we started coming out with different sorts of compositions and we did a lot of hit and trial to find out and determine the right composition of an artificial skin which can get as close to the real skin properties as possible right and we finally came out with this black uh, plot which is the artificial skin with some error bars showing that we have tested a lot of samples and we have pinpointed on certain compositions which we have tested through a lot of repeatability at least 
50 plus samples on the repeatability standpoint and finally we could declare it as an artificial skin which is as close as possible to the human skin and the greatest it has come so far uh, around the world right so uh, on the right side we can look at uh, some of these uh, final products of skin simulants it typically comes in any form of color uh, whatever you mix like with a silicon composition it, we call it a polymeric or a silicon based composition so the blue color is uh, due to a dye you can have different uh, other colors the key point here is uh, you are looking at the mechanical composition so it's the mixture ratio of the hardener and the cross linker these are the two broad components in a silicon uh, additive cure silicon addition cure silicon material so uh, these are mixed in a right fashion and that is what is patent protected right this mix ratios right so that nobody else can use it and we have the right to use it for making our skin simulants right so these can also come in different colors and this is uh, protected by the us patent number us 1004960 1b2 uh, known as the biofidelic skin simulant this was filed by me and my uh, supervisor uh, back at the university of alabama right so this is um, this work has been continued here in india uh, so uh, this is a screenshot of the patent application on the uh, bottom right uh, which you can look at and uh, so these are patents have a different purview so this is in the purview of the us and uh, it can be uh, in the purview of other countries as well and we have a set of patent applications after this in the indian context right so uh, one of the key uh, important parameters which we had in mind uh, while building this uh, skin simulant was to match the human skin properties with a low cost mass producible material we did not want to pick up a material which is not low cost and which is not mass producible such as hydrogels certain hydrogels are very difficult to process whatever materials need a lot of chemical or chemistry uh, kind of operations they are difficult to mass produce and sometimes they can be extremely high cost so we wanted something which is very low cost suitable for the uh, you know indian market so we came out with the material silicon uh, the next idea was uh, we wanted to come up with a rationale why we want to develop the artificial skin and one of the rationale was to study wound suture experiments. We developed this as a part of our research, ongoing research, but uh, the purpose was to study wound suture experiments, which we did not have uh, the liberty of using a cadaver or having an access to a cadaver to try and test those, right, back in the day. And uh, one of the key interest areas out of studying the wound suture experiments was can we standardize suturing practices so there is a very nice problem statement here uh, think about uh, how the world is moving towards a robotic surgeries right like so uh, many a times you will see uh, major surgeries uh, in any of the hospitals you have the option of doing a manual surgery or uh, semi robotic or a fully robotic so the world is going to slowly move towards a robotic surgery right so a majority of these robots do not have a lot of experience even though you can say this ai ml and all this uh, you know like uh, words can come in like uh, that they're self learning but uh, you know like computer has to learn from certain inputs right so that that part is still there so robot cannot just have a 20 years of experience doing a surgery that's not possible right now right but a surgeon does that so every surgeon is very different in the market like uh, so one surgeon can have a three years of experience they that person has a very different ways ways of conducting a surgery or suturing and another person has a 20 plus years of experience that person has a very different way of doing a surgery so which one which surgical practice should i translate or take and input it in into the robot so you may argue that uh, let us go with the 20 years one right but they may not be well versed with the latest technologies or the latest happenings out there so which one is the right practice so in order to do that we did a lot of wound suture experiments with the standard practices and we wanted to standardize some of the suturing practices so that a person who is basically uh, three years into the system or who is uh, let's say one year within the system and is a medical practitioner or a medical trainee they have a standard method of suturing as well as this can be also translated to a robot 
which can of course self learn but as a starting point can get the right suturing practices. So this was one of the key ideas uh, while developing the artificial skin right. So we wanted to determine suture forces for surgeries which are very important for a robot or any standard practice to uh, understand that how much suture force has to be applied uh, once you have placed a suture and determine the so suture forces for robotic surgery. So these were the key problem statements which we were following. So every invention, this is an invention, every uh, discovery, every development comes with certain backgrounds like you know like uh, we do not start one day saying let me build an artificial skin. How would I know what is being done so far in literature right. So everything comes with certain background, some problem which we are trying to solve like some healthcare problem which we are trying to solve and then we focus and see what is missing. So we found that an artificial skin which is highly reliable and similar to the human skin was missing. Can we develop that right. So that was the idea and that is how we started into our voyage in developing the artificial skin. Uh, next we wanted to also look at the training on suturing practices for different wound sizes and shape. So what happens when you have a different wound size? Is there any difference right? If you have a small wound versus a long wound versus a broad wound what is the difference? We wanted to do some parametric study to understand what is really going on with the suturing practices there do they have to be sutured in the same way. If we can learn this we can feed this information also to the surgeons as well as to the robots. So having this kind of background in mind we develop this artificial skin similar right. So what you are looking at on the right top is a set of skin samples human skin samples which we have tested first. So that is step one of development of any artificial tissue or uh, tissue simulants is you look at the real tissue right. Either you find out that information of the test results from literature where they have clearly declared what is the strain rate, what is the sample size, uh, what is the size different dimensions of the specimen, how many specimens were tested these kind of information has to be there that is number one technique. The other technique is if you have access to that real skin or real uh, tissue through a cadaver or something you test that first and set up some benchmarks that these are the possible stress strain profile or the properties which I have to match. So unless you know where you have to go you will not be able to go there. So you set a goal there. So that is what we did first we tested on uh, real human skin and we found uh, and we took the specimen sizes and everything and we determined all the stress strain profiles due to that right. And next we developed different compositions of artificial skin and then we wanted to validate by doing some suturing experiments here and on the real skin and see if the experimental results matched right. This is an extra validation step besides checking whether the material properties match whether besides the matching of the material property does it behave similarly when we do a similar operation like suturing that is also must because let us say the material property is almost similar but when you are trying to suture it is a very highly elastic or hard material and the skin is a very soft material then it does not solve that purpose right. So the overall purpose has to be solved through different levels of validation. So as we started our journey into the synthetic uh, artificial skin development we went through uh, different stages of uh, you know mixing and matching different compositions through hit and trial. So what we did uh, and uh, the most of the uh, key results are captured within this uh, large plot on the very left. So you are looking at a set of test compositions. Here we have mixed four parts, four different parts of silicon. They come in two different set of additive cure silicon. One type was uh, of a certain shore hardness where uh, based on the ratio by weight of the hardener and the crosslinker it will throw a certain property within a certain range and again with the second set it would be the same. But when we mix all this four comp components together then you mix the two sets and then you finally get a four part mixture ratio which you can very fine tune to get certain properties which are unique right. So having started with that we got a range of properties from the very beginning very very soft to very very hard. So most of these plots which you are looking at from the very bottom to the top went like that. We kept on changing the compositions and looking at what is the uh, property. 
We changed the composition, created five samples, tested it on the UTM and measured the properties, right? And we uh, placed all of these properties together in a single plot to compare properly whether the property is changing. So, for example, we had started with PDMS. We changed the PDMS compositions four or five times. It still yielded the same property. So, we realized that PDMS is not the right material to develop skin, right? So, the next one was uh, silicon. We have used polyurethane. Polyurethane was way too hard. Silicon was somewhere in between where there, are, there were a lot of options and we started building that different compositions of silicon. So, as we did that, we also compared each of the stress strain property of the different compositions with the skin, real skin properties. What we also realized from the literature as well as from our tests on the cadaveric uh, skin, that skin has not a single stress strain property, but has a range of properties depending on the location of the skin, whether I am taking a piece of skin from, from the forehead or from my arm or from the thigh, it has a different property because the thicknesses are also different. The Also, there is a difference in the property due to the anisotropy or the Langer lines. How you are cutting a sample, whether I am cutting a sam sample parallel to the Langer line or vertical to the Langer lines, right? So, these kind of location and uh, anisotropy had a huge effect on the skin properties. So, we basically defined a clear range of from where to where property in this restrain plot can be called a material as skin. Okay, that needed to be defined. So now if you see on the plot, we have defined something which is known as the skin lower bound and then we have another one which is known as the skin upper bound, right? So within the lower and upper bound, if any of our compositions lie, then we can safely say that this is some composition of skin or some form of skin. That is what we did exactly. We kept on building the different compositions and then we mixed and matched that this four or five compositions are within the range of real skin properties. Then the next step was fine tuning that, right? We had to develop one specimen, at least one composition or pick up one composition, which we are calling it as 9010 control specimen. Uh, control specimen is something which you use for repeatability and reproducibility tests, right? So if I say, uh, so what is repeatability and reproducibility? I'll explain both these terms because these are very important for experimental tests on soft tissues, right? But the 9010 control specimen specifically refers to a composition of 90% of one set of silicon and 10% by weight of another set of silicon. Uh, then uh, within that silicon uh, sets, they are distributed like 50-50% by weight or something like that, right? So that, that was the 9010 composition naming. Uh, so, what is repeatability? Repeatability is when I test the same sample. So, let us say I have the same sample which I have tested five times. Does it show the same property? It can never show the same property. It shows a little bit similar property and probably some variation, but the variation should not be drastic. So, if I see a plot like this, the other plot should not be like this. It should be somewhere close to that with maybe a four. 3 to 5 percent variation. Those kind of things are okay, right? That is the repeatability test. I want to make sure that whether this same sample gives the same stress strain profile when I test this five times. The next one is repeatability by composition. When I develop the same composition using the same set of silicons four or five times, does it lead to the same sample composition which I test and gives me the same property? Otherwise, what I would say is the composition is very sensitive or if something changes by a little bit, the entire property is going to change. That should not be the case, right? We need a composition which is reliable. So, if I test this composition tomorrow versus I build some samples today, they should behave similarly in terms of stress strain profile. So, these are the two types of repeatability. Here. Next is reproducibility. Reproducibility is I am using some type of silicon which is available in India and a set of silicons and I build this particular composition, let us say this 9010 control composition in India and I test it five times, it is giving me a certain stress strain profile, right? The same uh, composition is now known by somebody in US, let us say. So they purchase a silicon from their end, some other company 
and they create the same composition with the right hardness of the silicon and everything and they test it on their machine. Let us say the results are completely off, that means the results are not reproducible. Is it fault of uh, the research group in India? No, not really. So, uh, we have to clearly declare what machine was used, what was the strain rate and uh, what was the exact company. So, if somebody around the world is not using that same configuration, same machine and same uh, brand of silicon, it may give a little bit slightly, slightly different result. But if it is completely off result, then that is not a reliable or a reproducible composition. So, we did a lot of reproducibility tests to look at different silicons and uh, make compositions with that different brands of silicon and to make sure that they will give us the same property every time, right. So, this is repeatability and reproducibility I have explained. So, what we did next was we took the 9010 control specimen and uh, we found out that it is closer to the skin lower bound. So, we could consider it as very close to the skin lower bound. And then we repeated the test around 30 times, right. So, we got a lot of uh, stress strain plots for that, but they almost matched and we could draw an error bar within 5 percent, right. So, that meant that we had not only created an artificial skin which lies within the range of uh, lower to upper bound, but we had created a repeatable and reproducible artificial skin, which is of importance, right. So, these are some of the terms which we should learn while we are trying to develop soft tissue simulates. We ran a set of other tests to make sure that uh, the uh, soft tissue simulant or the artificial tissue which we had built for skin is as close to possible to the real human skin properties. So, what were those tests? Uh, repeatability tests I have already explained uh, on the very top right control uh, 9010 test specimens. Second is similar low and high strain modulus. We wanted to uh, draw a low strain modulus by dropping a tangent from starting from the zero, uh, 0 point in the plot to the curve as well as we did the same from the top of the plot to the curve, a tangent. We dropped a tangent. Th those are known as uh, low and high strain modulus in terms of slope, right. So, that gives, you, gives us an idea till what limit a particular skin simulant material is going to stretch to and let us compare whether that is similar to the real skin. Third was ultimate tensile stress. What is the maximum limit to which you can pull this or maximum amount of load which you can apply to this uh, skin specimen before it completely fractures or ruptures? Can we compare that with real skin properties, right? So, what we did see here on the figure on the right is we saw a certain fracture pattern and uh, the uh, silicon based specimen did fracture. But what we did notice was this fracture pattern was very, very different from the real skin fracture, how it would fracture, right. So, that means it is not a very reliable metric to study ultimate tensile stress properties and also the ultimate tensile stress values were way, way different. They were within certain ranges, but they were still very different. So, that is why we could very clearly state that we have created a repeatable skin simulant, reproducible skin simulant lying within the stress strain nonlinear profile, but we cannot particularly say that the ultimate tensile strength or the fracturing of this tissue simulant model is going to be similar to the real skin. So, that is a clear caveat or an assumption which has to be declared, right. So, what are the shortcomings and limitations of our work that, that those were declared, right. So, this is the synthetic artificial skin introduction, uh, how we had done this. Based on this, we moved a little bit more advanced. We next uh, went uh, to something which is known as a hydrogel based artificial skin, right. This uses a lot of uh, knowledge about the biochemistry, which we are not an expert in, but we uh, adapted some of the uh, biochemistry standard practices based on the literature. So, uh, here we are using porous hydrogels with feel similar to the natural tissues in order to create the uh, artificial skin. Hydrogel compositions were optimized to obtain the skin mechanical properties. So, what happens is hydrogels typically have around 90 percent plus water contents that is why they are called hydrogels and rest is uh, the gelation powder which mixes with the water to create those gels, right. So, you have a 
very small play uh, area there 5 to 10 percent is what you can change the powder and rest is water right so when you use a lot of water the hydrogel becomes very soft when you use less of water the hydrogen becomes a little hard but you have very little room to change the composition so changing the composition as well as to have some mechanical stiffness so that it doesn't break as well as having a mechanical property similar to this skin was a very challenging task we had to spend a lot of time changing different compositions uh, you know like very specific chemistry had to be uh, looked upon to create those hydrogel based synthetic skin so uh, here is an example on the left where you're looking at the stress strain profile uh, you're looking at the human skin properties which is in the uh, dashed black color then uh, you have one chemical set of chemicals which were mixed to create an hydrogel uh, which are known as pni pam slash ka2 right but that produced properties which were much greater or stiffer than the actual human skin then when we change this to pni pm slash go2 right graphic oxide uh, that that again created a property which was much lower than the human skin However, when we mixed PNI, PAM, A, A2, GO2 all together in the right mixed ratios, which are the right chemistry, then we got a property very similar to the human skin, right? But one thing to note here, the overall property of this material was much lower than what we have observed previously. Here you are looking at a stress of uh, 20 megapascals or 25 megapascals and here you are just looking at a 200 kilopascals which is fairly low. So you are playing in a small range. If you remember most of the in vivo techniques like which has indentation and imaging, it gives you the force displacement or stress strain in a very small uh, range or with small loads. That is the same case with the hydrogels, right. We could not test them or operate them at a very high load. They would disintegrate. Or breakdown right so but still this was a nice find and uh, we could create uh, skin simulants which we could uh, subject to compression as well as tension tension like in a universal testing machine as you can see on the figures on the left uh, the top one is a compression test right one is a middle one is a uh, tensile test uh, we did a cost calculation because we were really uh, focused not only on the material but also how this would uh, function in the Indian context. So we did a cost breakup analysis. So uh, we saw was uh, around 10 by 10 centimeters like this is the size of the skin. So 10 by 10 centimeters of skin uh, with this or a artificial skin did developed with hydrogels uh, with a close to 0 0.4 centimeters thickness. Uh, this amounts to 40 cc of hydrogel uh, with a density of 0 0.1 to 1 gram per cc uh, which will lead to approximately 40 grams maximum mass. Uh, so the cost breakup of the major raw materials like poly N isopropyl acrylamide uh, which is poly N uh, PAM and uh, so this was uh, then P, uh, PNI PM is 0.1 gram would cost around rupees 29 right polyacrylic acid which is the paa this would cost for 1 gram around rupees 4 uh, graphene oxide uh, geo would cost around uh, rupees 6 every 0.2 grams so uh, and the distilled water is the cheapest 34.5 gram was needed uh, to build one sample and that would cost rupees 5 right so other chemicals and supplies were uh, costing around rupees 3 so the total cost of material for a 40 cc hydrogel uh, based artificial skin was around rupees 47 right so with this 40 cc of hydrogels it uh, by comparing the densities it was almost equivalent to 93.2 grams of silicon right in terms of mass and volume right so in terms of mass specifically so with a density of silicon of 2.33 grams per cc we what we saw was a hydrogel will cost at the amounts of rupees 500 per kg equivalent of silicon so per kg of silicon equivalent of silicon the hydrogel will cost around 500 rupees which is not a lot 
which, which is a reasonable amount. So we did find that this hydrogel is cost effective. But what was an issue was uh, to develop all these compositions and with our limited knowledge of biochemistry, we could not make the hydrogels very consistently or repeatably uh, with the high reprodu reproducibility or repeatability. That was not possible, right? So from a mass manufacturing standpoint, this seemed a little challenging, which may be overcome with some collaborations in the future, right? So this was uh, one of our attempts in the hydrogel based artificial skin development. The next interesting uh, soft tissue simulant which we developed was, was of an artificial artery. So the human artery which I may have explained uh, in the uh, previous sessions is a very very complex system in uh, terms of the tissue. It has three layers of the tissue uh, commonly known as the intima which is the innermost layer followed by the media and the adventitia which is the outermost layer. Each of this layer has a different composition of the uh, tissue uh, in terms of properties as well as the direction of fibers. In one of these, the fibers are coil. In one of these, the fibers are longitudinal. So properties of each layer are very, very different. And it has a unique structure and arteries have undulations and structures, structure changing which, which goes from one uh, point to another in the human body, right? So Another part was this is highly patient specific. So not all the arteries look the same or with the same thickness or the same undulations across human bodies, right? Like so that's why we realized that this has to be a patient specific approach in order to develop an artificial artery. So we did a patient specific three layer human artery model and we could create it as close as possible to the real artery. Uh, what was the background or the purpose? We are going to revisit this purpose statement again and again whenever we talk about any artificial tissue development. So the purpose here was to look at stents. So whenever there is a blocked artery, right, blocked coronary artery specifically, coronary artery is the main artery in the human uh, heart. So whenever there is a blocked artery, uh, there is an angioplasty procedure which, which is used to open it using a stent, right? So how do you size a stent? How do you know the right size of a stent which needs to go in inside this artery, which already has a clot, right? So this is typically taken through imaging, 2D imaging or a two-dimensional imaging technique, it is shown. But what is what may happen in 3D may be very, very different. The stent may have a diameter from the imaging standpoint of this much, which is let's say, 3 millimeters or 4 millimeters, but going in the other direction, there may be a lot of clot where the stent may get completely uh, stuck or may uh, produce or uh, generate a lot of pressure on the arterial wall, which may cause other difficulties with infections as well as the blood flow, right? So what we realized was, first thing, we wanted to look at the artery from a model standpoint in three dimension and second is we want to have a mechanism where the right size stent can be selected for any surgery, right? It should not be oversized because oversized stents can uh, damage the wall of the artery and create thrombosis and further infection. And an undersized artery will not be able to solve, serve its purpose of opening up the artery properly to remove the clot, right? And allow the passage of blood. So we wanted to make sure we could develop patient-specific artificial artery models before it goes for the stenting operation, a medical practitioner or a doctor is able to insert a stent within this model and try and test what should be the right stent size and stent type which should go within this system before doing the surgery. So that was, it's, a, it's known as a pre-surgical planning as an overview, right? So this was the purpose behind creating the patient-specific three-layer human artery surrogates or the artificial arteries. Uh, the fabrication method was uh, fairly similar in terms of the materials, but in terms of uh, the coiling of the artery or it has a um, undulating surface, we had to use 3D printing, right? So uh, the first step what we did was we created, we took a set of MRI images, uh, you know, like from one of the patients, we uh, created an arterial model right, like a coronary artery model uh, and sectioned it in the place where there was a blockage or something like that, right, like 
uh, we basically section this uh, particular area where the stent has to be placed or uh, which we have to model here. And uh, what we uh, got as a model after stacking it using a DICOM file and image segmentation is the hollow part of that artery which is known as the arterial lumen, right. So we 3D printed the arterial lumen shape or structure. The next step is we wanted to grow the different arterial layers on top of this lumen and take this and uh, in the top of the lumen uh, 3D printed model and take this lumen model out so that there is a proper hollow within the arterial system. So uh, after the MRI 3D printing, we what we did was we created the four part silicon mixture in different ratios. Uh, each of the so now we had three different ratios simulating each of the properties for the different layers. If you look at the graph on the right, what you can see here is basically you are looking at a very uh, cluttered plot. Uh, let me just go into that. Uh, maybe I can uh, zoom in. Space over. Okay. Thank you. I will continue to continue to continue to so uh, what you are looking at here is the plot on the right where uh, you are seeing a lot of very cluttered information. Uh, what this information really tells us and I could not uh, use the entire screen to present it. It shows the uh, values of the mechanical properties or the stress strain profiles which has been collected in literature through study of the arteries. So there have been researchers specifically there is a researcher known as Holzapfel uh, in Europe. He has worked extensively in the areas of soft tissue and he has developed uh, different measurement techniques to measure the properties of the uh, different layers of the arteries. So he has been able to dissect the different layers and measure the properties, right. So these properties are what, what you see on the top right of the plot and then uh, most of the straight looking lines are the compositions of the silicon uh, which we have used to closely simulate these properties which have been derived from the literature, right. But as you can see majority of the curved lines could not be matched very well with the linear lines, right, which we are seeing. And we are looking at kilopascals that is why majority of our compositions are looking very linear. If you go with a higher load it will kind of bend over, right. So uh, even though the curves were not very nicely simulated we could still at a very low strain kind of safely say that we had some compositions which we could identify which could properly simulate the mechanical properties of the intima media and adventitia. So this is what we did as an exercise with a lot of different material compositions testing them again and again looking at the ranges and looking at which particular composition is very close to this particular profile of stress and strain which has been derived from literature testing on real arterial tissues, right. Then uh, we developed a very new technique once we had developed the compositions. We developed a very new technique which is known as a timed control dipping technique for layer thickness control. So another very important thing here with the arteries are what is the thickness of each of these layers. I cannot randomly put it as 1 millimeter or 2 millimeters. They are all properly documented in literature. Those are the layer thicknesses which we found out. And what we came up with a technique where we have a certain composition of silicon uh, we, and we wanted to dip this 3D printed lumen model within this after a certain time because within that time the silicon has cured a little bit, let us say 20 minutes and it has hardened a little bit. After that hardening, it is going to create a layer which is of let us say 1 millimeter. If I pour, the, uh, pour this particular model into the silicon within the first 5 or 10 minutes, it may create a layer which is of 0 0.2 millimeters for example. So one of my job for a few months was to do this time control tech dipping all through the day 
to figure out after what time should you dip to get this much amount of thickness which I desire. That thickness is very clear from the literature, right? So, after doing all this exercise, I could come up with the most perfect artery model. This is what you are seeing on the uh, very right bottom. So, this is an arterial model with a clear intima media and advantage exactly the same layer thickness what it should be in a real coronary artery and the mechanical properties are also very similar. Before doing this we came up with some uh, single layer arterial models as well as a practice which is shown in uh, the middle picture but the right bottom picture is the final product which we came up with. Now this model could be tested with stents and other uh, different medical devices right. So, this was our development of an artificial artery. The next uh, model which I am going to talk about is of an artificial brain tissue. So, artificial brain tissue I had already explained in one of the previous sessions. They were uh, we found out there were no simulants to date which can uh, mimic the mechanical properties of the brain tissue. So, we first of all created some silicon based compositions to make brain tissues tensile specimens which is tensile properties or pulling properties which are similar to the brain tissue. We came out with different compositions, tested them on the UTM at particular strain rates which has been clearly stated in literature. So, we derived the values from the literature. Then this part I have already explained in uh, previous sessions where we have created an artificial uh, brain model and basically within this brain model we have not only created the structure based on uh, you know like the actual human body designs and the human body uh, dimensions of a patient as well as we have created a whole brain model and using additive manufacturing we could make two parts and uh, using the compressive property picking up the right mixture of silicon we made this model and finally we got them tested in three different configurations. Uh, the top portion of the parietal lobe, prefrontal cortex of the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. These were the three different configurations in which we uh, see impacts typically in a human body and these are the three, uh, three examples which we uh, took like in order to do the mechanical characterization in different strain rates. And finally, we could compare the results. Uh, I will just get to the key highlights here. So, what we did find out was due to the orientation change there was a huge difference in the uh, mechanical property which was reported but with the strain rate the brain tissue did not see a huge change in the mechanical property right. We also were able to cuff fit everything when we went from load versus displacement to stress versus strain almost those differences also vanished. We saw a very unique almost single property of the uh, brain tissue irrespective of the direction in which we placed. Uh, and uh, irrespective of the strain, strain rates, right. So, as a conclusion what we found out was uh, for the brain tissue artificial model which we had developed, it had a very consistent stress strain profile and stress strain profile is what we should consider for testing or comparing any soft tissue as we go along and uh, based on the strain rate and changing in orientation specifically the brain tissue did not behave very sim differently but the other tissues can which we are going to uh, cover next and talk about more. So, stay tuned. Uh, we are going to finish it here for this lecture and uh, we will pick it up from here and talk about more soft tissue simulants. Thank you.